So one way to think about what happens when you take a charge and now put it in this background of positively and negatively charged particles, this plasma and thermal equilibrium, is that the very value of the charge itself, rho or delta rho in the case of the charge is a small perturbation to the overall field, that charge gets renormalized, it's altered. The value of the parameter is now changed, in fact, by an amount proportional to the very field that that charge introduces. So there's a nonlinear effect here that you put a charge into the plasma, the charge induces a potential, particles flow in to partially cancel that potential, and when those two effects balance, at that point you have the new value of the charge. Now I've told that story sort of dynamically unfolding over time, but in fact, the equations here have no dynamical part to them. So basically, you can think of this as sticking a particle in and then asking about how, on larger and larger scales, the average charge within that box behaves. So instead of thinking about the potential here as a new theory of electromagnetism, we can also think about it as a story about how charges coarse grain on larger and larger scales. So now I'm going to put these two terms together and just say that there is the same law that we originally began with, the 1 over r squared law. It's just that as you go to larger and larger scales, the charge itself appears to change. And in fact, it sort of looks like this, right? Here's the scale you're looking at, and here's the charge of the particle. As r gets larger and larger, eventually, that charge cuts off. I'm going to write this here as log q. So this is an exponential cutoff. As r goes past the Debye length, it gets increasingly shielded. And so this is a direct analog in a more complicated fashion because of this nonlinearity here. This is a direct analog to all of the other renormalization stories we've seen. You look at the system on a larger scale. You measure this charge not at this distance here, but at a slightly larger distance here. And what you find when you look on that larger scale, you say, hey, what's this charge like? What is an electron like? Well, it depends how expensive your equipment is. It depends on the resolution with which you can observe that electron. If you're only, if you're only able to get electrons within a certain distance of each other, let's say one meter, the electron charge looks like one thing. But if you're able to get closer and closer, in general, what you find is the electron charge gets stronger and stronger. The Debye length is what sets that crossover point at least in the thermal plasma case. In that case, there is this exponential cutoff. And so in fact, at very large distances, you don't see any electrons at all. They're completely shielded by the effect of that background, which is invisible to you, right? And so one way to think about the Debye length is a sort of scale upon which electromagnetism acts. In the case of many of the astrophysical plasmas that you might think about, such as the solar wind, the Debye length is in fact on the scale of meters. And so in that case, basically, if you put a charge here and you walk 10 meters away, its effect is completely dissipated by the effect that the overall thermal distribution of the plasma has. As you get closer and closer, all of a sudden, you start to see the charge. And in, let, and in the classical case, what happens is that as you make measurements closer and closer to the charge itself, you start to see that, in fact, the charge is there and it does have an effect. There is in the classical case, a nice limit. So at very small distances, the whole theory kind of works out. What's scary in the case of quantum electrodynamics is that this pattern here actually looks more like that pattern there. As you get closer and closer to the electron, as you penetrate further and further into that virtual cloud, the equations that correspond to how these fields get set up, the quantum, uh, the, uh, quantum field theoretic equations, actually make it look that that charge diverges. So then what do you do? We say, look, I don't know what the fundamental theory of the world is, but I do know what the charge looks like at some point. And if I know what the charge looks like at some point, if I fix the value there, I can tell you how the rest of the theory works out. And I can tell you how the theory is going to allow me to observe that charge at different scales. But in order to tell that story, I now have to put in a fluctuating value of the charge. The charge is changing depending upon the scale at which I observe it. Just as the Markov chain changes, that theory changes, the parameters of that theory change when I observe on coarser and coarser time scales, just as the cellular automata 
model changes, the underlying law changes when I coarse grain at larger and larger spatial and temporal scales, and just as the coupling constants in the icing model change when I look at increasingly larger and larger lattice spacings as I cross out particles uh, in the lattice to make a larger lattice that I can then twist and say looks identical to the original one. In all of these cases, what I'm able to do is keep the structure of the theory reasonably constant and talk about how the parameters of that theory flow. Now, what you've been able to see is a very rough cartoonish picture of the classical case. In the quantum case, it looks a little bit stranger because of that divergence. And so very often when we talk about renormalization, at least if you look in the stories about renormalization we have, mostly from the theoretical physicists, renormalization is fundamentally tied up with these infinities, these sort of dangerous infinities that emerge when you go to scales that are too fine for the theory to describe. And then that's where everything goes crazy. And of course, famously, the theory that we can't renormalize, right, the theory where these um, these, these uh, divergences that happen at short distances, when those divergences can't be taken away by sort of fixing a value here and looking at what happens forward. Famously, one of the ones that is non renormalized but at least in standard field theory, is gravity. Gravity seems to violate the things we want our renormalized theory to do. And in fact, you have a little bit of a sense of how that works now. If you go back to the icing model, and you remember when we took the decimation of the lattice, we induced a higher order coupling. But we said, you know what, let's just ignore the higher order coupling for now and just kind of fiddle the second order couplings and see if we can make the theory work. And in fact, you were able to get pretty close. In that case, we could neglect the higher order couplings that were coming in. It turns out that not all theories work that way. Sometimes when we renormalize, we don't get back something that looks like a nice sort of slightly twisted version of the theory we began with, with shifted parameters. In fact, what we get are all sorts of new terms that appear in the theory, and now we have trouble explaining how those terms themselves renormalize. It's no longer possible to fix the values of the parameters of the theory at some particular scale and then know how everything flows. This is, for example, in the classical case, depending upon the plasma density, how that theory flows on larger and larger scales. In some cases, our theories have a structure that frustrates the renormalization process. Those theories we call non renormalizable. Quantum electrodynamics, it turns out, is, makes it possible not only to talk about how the electron charge appears when you go further and further away from that virtual cloud, it also enables you to take out some of these affinities without there being too much pain. But that's not always the case. So what I've done here is give you an analogy to the quantum mechanical problem of how an electron interacts with a vacuum of virtual particles. I've given you a slightly different one, which is the plasma story. In this case, the positive and negatively charged particles exist for all time. They're sitting there and they can flow about. It's slightly different from the case where an electron pulls positive and negative charges out of the vacuum. In that case, they begin closely separated. And as, as uh, Murray and Frank said in their paper, one of the, the, uh, virtual, the, the uh, negative virtual electron goes to very far distances. Right? They have to kind of pull out of the vacuum in a neutral pair or a pair whose overall charge is neutral. In the plasma case, it's slightly different. And so the curves that you see here that we've derived for that classical thermal case don't directly apply to the quantum case. But at the very least, I've given you a sense about how a spatial renormalization problem allows you to change or shows how the theory of electromagnetism changes when you go to larger and larger scales, when you measure the charge of the electron at 10 centimeters, 20, a meter, 100 meters or conversely, a millimeter, a nanometer, a femtometer, when you get closer and closer on the other side.